large crowd is expected. I'm so happy to see that as you know, the choice of writers we are presenting today is excellent. A large crowd has appeared. Thank you. So 19, 90 years later, it gives us a pre great pleasure to help to, to celebrate our five scholarship winners, whom you will hear from, and I'm not going to waste time naming them right now uh, because we are running a little late. And we're also glad to introduce our first print production, Bookmark, uh, which is an anthology of selections from the first five issues. Pre is a digital magazine, so we thought that we know that not everyone is online, and uh, especially for the older writers and older people who are not online, we, we've produced a print production, a, a book, an anthology, and please support us by buying copies which are available at the back through Rebel Women Lit. So, um, <clears throat> right, so, and we are very happy to throw our weight behind this campaign to sort of try and um, resuscitate Ormsby Hall and recover it as a space for the arts. Imagine if they needed a venue like this almost 90 years ago, there was a feeling, and this is why Ormsby Hall came into existence, that there was a need for such a venue. Uh, almost 100 years later, we can't deny that and I hope that the relevant you know business interests will come forward and do what's necessary I just like to I mean we need to understand the you know what soft power is and writing literature film all the cultural things that Jamaica and the Caribbean are so strong in we really need to leverage it more than we have or than, than we are doing so um, this, is, this is one such attempt. I'd just like to thank the Prince Klaus Fund, the University of the West Indies, Sarah Shabaka, who designed our beautiful flyer, Naomi Jackson, Carolyn Cooper, Laura Facey, and Tam Tamara Scott Williams, and Banton. Um, Banton has made two pots of soup and there are a few drinks at the back which you're all welcome to partake of. We didn't anticipate such a large crowd, so when it runs out, I'm afraid it's out. But in the meantime, please enjoy the proceedings. Thank you. Indeed, we are really grateful to have such a turnout for a literary event. This is wonderful and we should celebrate this. Please take a look around and recognize that we do read. We read Caribbean, we read in Jamaica. So our first reader will be Yashika Graham. She is a Jamaican writer, visual artist, and the 2019 recipient of the Mervyn Morris Prize for Poetry. She has won several awards in that regard and she's also published um, pretty widely, I'd say, and including in by Pre. So please let's welcome Yashika Graham right now. Greetings, everyone. It is an absolute privilege to be here with you. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this space with us. Pre, maximum respect. All right. So. These poems I'm about to read are from my forthcoming collection, Some of Us Can Go Back Home, and it's coming to you from Blouse and Skirt Books. This first poem is Caribbean Postcard from Fort Warden. My teacher says, occupy any seat in the schoolhouse. I pretend to be on the bronze madrona near Alexander Castle. She walks the room issuing postcards of tigers, birds, places towering over water. For me, a lighthouse card with sparks of reds, whites, ocean coming in, and I think I spot my land in the undergrowth. Teacher says, rip your card, and I do not. The graying woman who borrowed my pencil bites her bird. Tell me what it feels like, my teacher says. And the man with the tiger's eye in his left hand says he thought of old faces overgrown with ivy, rusting. I fold, wary of losing another land, allowing the column of white 
to mask the lilies, the sea grapes, saving the tower as something inland. But I fold again and fracture the stone, consume the sea. Again, my teacher says, and my island goes white under me. Thank you. This is the year you get married. I stopped sitting in Papine Square looking to skyline. I dismantled the history of that hill, made straight the winding roads, got off your bike, walked home. I released Hope River, or shadow on its rocks, or salt in the water, and in St. Mary, I rounded up what was left of us, the jonquil beads we gathered in Galena, the bronzed leaf from a rockabessa. I burnt the last of your incense and for the final time read your yellow letters bound in blue shoestring. What I could not purge myself of, your hold on my mother, your portrait of me as angel under jacaranda, the Polaroids, the Robin's text, all these I doused with wine, blessed and kept. The prodigal conjures a return for my father. We used to watch morning turn gray, go black, searching for you. Your yard, giddy with the children you chose. Your woman, guarding the door to send us out as we came in. Playing your game, we joined the dance, the hopscotch, dandy shandy the falls-eyed hide-and-seek under raised board houses. Playing your game, we masked empty bellies with cricket, pulled down wisp when skipping. And you must think we spent these years still looking. I leave that part out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yashika Graham. And to all those who are online, I did suggest that there would be a giveaway of a bookmarked anthology text. So maybe the teacher in me, the lecturer in me, might ask you some sort of um, analytical question. And if you put a good answer in, maybe something about the literary devices, poetic devices being used, maybe you can be the winner. So pay keen attention. Okay, um, all right, I'm really grateful to be here. Actually, I grew up around the road from here, so this feels like a coming home in a way. Even though I kind of feel like a fraud because I haven't written a poem in three years, but um, I will read some of the poetry that I've written and um, a few reflections from uh, an essay that I'm working on. Okay. Okay. This poem is called Easter Sunday, and as a queer person growing up in Jamaica, I was always like really fascinated by how the word fish circulates, you know, as a slur, but also as something we love to eat during Easter. And so, to me, I wanted to find a way to say
Okay. Even though I haven't written a poem in three years, I feel like I've been trying to work through the same ideas, even in my academic work. Um, and so, informally, I guess, kind of formally too, but informally, I have been my family's historian for the last 10 to 15 years. Comedy just little enough, and you know, I, I started asking questions about where people came from, and you know, the history of our family and so on. So I've been doing that for quite some time. And so over the course of the last year, I've been doing oral history interviews with my, the older women in my family, um, other queer folks in my family as well. Um, and so I wrote this reflection because I also had a recent falling out with my parents because I'm queer and so I wanted to kind of come to terms with some of the ideas about myself that I didn't take the time to reflect on until I was in conflict with, you know, everything I had I'd held there. Yeah. Okay. I have always loved Harborview, a little asthmatic town by the sea with a hopelessly lethargic sense of drama and a fiercely aspirational middle-class spirit always trying so hard to distinguish itself from the surrounding chaos of the ghettos on the hill. Yes, a boy might get gunned down by the police or girls in uniform might grow fat with empty promises. But in this year, how about you? Children are the future and we get down on our knees and pray that time in a place like Jamaica will be kind to us. And when we get up from that bedside, soak true with the exhaustion of prayer and intercession, we get to work on making sure that if our children cannot have the American dream, they can, at the very least, have the Jamaican one. A house on the hill, a king alarm gate, <laughs> and any car that doesn't resemble the dirty taxi them on the street. But we also went to work in other ways through acts of quietness, or what I like to call, quote, the middle-class Jamaican whisper. My working-class family argues in the yard. Those are the ones around the street from here, actually. My working-class family argues in the yards, peeling each other open as commentators watch from verandas and from sidewalks, arms akimbo, fully aware that they need not have been invited to the brawl. No. In fact, they give the quarrel meaning they prove that someone has witnessed this, even if it will never make it into any official histories. Someone has witnessed this tracing. Such an apt word I've come to realize to describe the kind of cussing where one not only colorfully sizes up one's opponent, but their people, and their people's people, and their people's people's people. A literal tracing that would put any genealogist to shame. No historian could ever recall how Jennifer Tifi Tifi, just like her great grandfather, who her finger them did, the police did have to chop off. No historian could ever detail how Peter walk and sex off any and everybody like him, workless mama. And so, this tracing, this act of memory, or what Toni Morrison might call re memory, this strategy of recalibrating and rearranging the details of the past towards dynamic uses in the present is a relation to time and history of which my middle-class family is not only aware, but terrified. In fact, my grand aunt in an interview I conducted with her told me that, quote, not everything needs to be on tape, and insisted that I turn the sound recorder off halfway through our conversation. And even after I shut it off, she whispered all the salacious details of the family feud over my great-grandparents' house in the countryside. This whisper is one I believe to also be incredibly conscious of the archive. After all, to whisper is to be aware of the fact that others might hear you, might mark your words down for posterity. The middle class Jamaican whisper, therefore, not to be confused with other forms of whispers, involves an intense awareness of how information circulates. It is not necessarily oppositional to documentation, 
Rather, it operates on the premise that the knowledge being transferred should only be accessible to very few people in order to maintain respectability. It is, in other words, a respectable form of gossip. And so, people whispered about my cousin Kevin, who was that way growing up, in what feels to him a fever dream of an adolescence that arrived on the tail end of the HIV AIDS crisis. When the ambulance had arrived on the street to quietly wheel away the lifeless body of another that way man who could no longer live with his diagnosis, it was whispered, our family tightened the reins. They would not allow any homosexuals, not to ever be confused with the term batiman, which was too vulgar, too loud, to mash up the future that pastor prophesied. I'm gonna stop here, I feel like I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stirring it up, stirring it up. So definitely we wanna think about that, right? The literal tracing and how it is that we record our histories for posterity or otherwise. Our next reader will be Tanisia Pratt. Now, Tanisia is a content writer, poet, and performance artist from the Bahamas. Because we're not just Jamaican in here, right? Okay. So she's from the Bahamas, yes, yes, yes. And we are excited to um, have her here. She has um, published pretty widely um, palette, poetry, of course with Pre, Pui, Write About Now, Tamarin Journal, and also performed in multiple spaces, including spaces in the Bahamas. Now, I'll stop talking and say, Tanisia Pratt, come on up. I'm a bit short. <laughs> thank you, thank you everybody for having me here. This is actually my first time in Jamaica and I am not disappointed. I love it and I don't wanna go back. <laughs> Clap for yourself, okay, big up yourself. <laughs> so, I will be reading a few poems from my recent collection, which is titled Blue. Um, and Blue basically explores three years of my life in terms of love, heartbreak, jealousy, the body, trauma, and of course, the Bahamas. So the first poem that I am going to read for you is called Ola Kuhn's Son. You spoke in trade wind, nature's beloved, reeling me into your current, a powering force, hoisting my body to sail. I am ship without anchor. I am tangled sargassum, bloated with salt, long ways from home. When the moonlight hits, I catch a glimmer of your aquasphere, enchanted, wishing to climb the depths of your indigo, to splinter my feet on sunken iron and driftwood. Yet, you prefer me suspended, reeking of fish guts and coral, unable to break your brackish surface, to find the skeletal treasures you hide below. For years, I danced this tide for you, sun bleached, my face a sepia frame, lost at sea, soon to forget why I loved you. So this poem is inspired by Marion Bethel's Tobacco Dove, and it's called Vagabond. I was on the road, riding where doves don't fly, racing full moons on wet tar, gulping salt winds for cheap highs. I was a raven with metal wings, soaring past cemeteries, kissing ghosts with resentful desire, ensuring still to stare clear of the potholes and concrete poles. I ain't no white dove, but a black swan, a vagabond, peddling through swamps of nameless streets, 
filthy breath of tobacco and mud rum. I love the paper weight of these feathers, how they would glide under spillages of streetlights. I lurked in the shadows of empty bars, singing love letters in amber bottles. The night was redemption for this heart, heavy with unspeakable regrets. I longed to be absorbed into the pitch black of dusk, to speed the vastness of the road until the floor shook, to stare up at the stars until I too was without name. I was on the road, riding where doves don't fly. Salvation, he ain't never come round here. And I was not the dutiful wife of Abraham. This next poem is actually, um, it was published in Pri's Ecoside issue. I, months, months after Hurricane Dorian, um, I had come back home from school and I was thinking a lot about the climate crisis in the Caribbean um, and our strained, our strained relationship as people with our environment. And that New Year's Day morning, I went to the beach and I heard my Grammy's voice. So this is from Mary Pratt. All my cheering is leave after some time and once they just go, they just don't come back. Sometime, all of mine is come back, you know, sometime. They just don't want go till they have day on churin. And sometime when they churin, have they churin. Yeah. But you just don't check for me like that, man. Not like how you used to check for me. I remember you used to mussy come round every Sunday. Now it look like you're caught up in all kind of things. But I still happy I get to see you. Oh, I happy you come because these churin don't come round like that and they don't even bring day churn. You eat? I think I could find something here for you, but yeah, you can't get too deep up in these things. Soon I can be here, and when I dead after you done been in all kind of things, you ain't gonna be crying and hurting up your head. You still is eat fish? I think snapper here, but I know. You know fish getting harder to catch. Conk, snapper, grouper, I remember you used to like when I big grouper, but I know when last grouper catch either. Fishing around like that no more. That's cause them people is be teething the fish when they small and every day they dingin', diggin', diggin' for something new. That's why you can't let everybody touch your things. But I can fix you something, baby. Oh, I so glad you come to see me cause I ain't been feeling too good. You know this food? Don't be no real food. And I sure that's why I just be having pains. That's why I just say, I know how long I can be around. So make sure you come check to see me while I still breathing. You remember we used to go to the beach? You was always scared, you know. So I used to have to hold you in my hand. You ever to learn to float by yourself? I could show you, you know. If you come back tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, maybe in the morning, or the late afternoon, when it ain't too much tourists, if you come back here, I can teach you. I can teach you just how to swim. The last poem is based on the folk tale in the Bahamas called The Gallen Wife. And it's basically about this trick, this trickster woman, wife in the morning and in the full moon, she changes into a bird until one night her husband catches her. I am the Gallen wife. I am the folklore left on your Grammy's tongue. The gal your daddy warned you of, I am the Gallen wife. A symbol of allure, treachery, and magic. Part bird, part woman, yet all the lesson, I am a lesson. 
to be made an example of, I am the Garland wife. I am the bird you shot down. I am the wife you shoot up. I am the one we always crucify. Been feeling more bird than woman lately. More animal than human. More dispensable than the change I never see. A man is not pleased with me and I am killed. A man sees my wings and believes I will fly away. Violence is the ultimate answer here. Whether in real life or the tales we tell ourselves. Teaching our boys that murder is fine once they were tricked. Promising our girls with life if they only could behave. My plantation has ballooned into a country holding strong to old traditions. Wives must stay at home. Females must know their place. There is no such thing as women's rights or marital rape here. Only rationalizations for the brutality we face. In 2011, a man butchered his sweetheart to death. He wrote on the machete, this is what cheaters get. 2014, a man accused his girlfriend for having hickeys and for that, she was tabbed five times about the body in 2016. A man in his 30s guns down a 15-year-old girlfriend. She was killed outside of a nightclub for dancing with other men. But how do we not see folk tales in our everyday lives? Women fighting to own their bodies, men chanting, mine, mine, mine. We are so quick to blame the woman that no one remembers that the woman died. Misogyny is not a mindset we only find in the East. In the cancer, like a cancer, it spreads over every area it can. It is the sympathy we never give. It is the love we never get. It is culture, like the songs we sing and the stories we tell. I ruminate on the Gallen wife and wonder, was she ever a bird at all? Perhaps just a simple woman, the wings, a metaphor for her freedom, and a husband heated in his shame, seeking retribution through a shotgun. And at that moment, she was no longer woman, more animal than human. So who? Do you think you are where you think you going, girl? Okay, so we won't be settling your nerves at all today. <sighs> Exhale, thank you. Next, we have our final um, young participant today. Caleb Diaguilar, who is a Jamaican writer and filmmaker. His passion for the arts, it started with the drama club at Arden High School, and later he joined Quilt. Now, Caleb, get over here. Oh God, stop. <laughs> uh, hey everyone, yeah. Really happy to be here, very thankful. Um, okay. Uh, I'm gonna read you two poems, which I've been living in London the last three years, um, and, and kind of going back and forth the last five, and so some of this comes from those experiences. Um, Thinking on the green I see in transit. Marooned in the gray, you decided to garden. How cunningly you masked your pain. Olive Senio, Meditation on Red. One. Here, from London to Birmingham, traveling through on train, I see cabbage, lettuce, and sheep. The green is vast and never ending, meeting a similar gray at the furthest point. We ride over this land, lost in the bleak terrain called England. Home from Kingston to St. Elizabeth, looking out my dad's pickup, I see carrot, tomato, chocha, jackfruit, orange, otaiti, banana. Though we don't have fall, we see colors all year round with blue waters meeting yellow skies and multiple shades of brown bathing in the green. Two. In the old days, when the grass was tall and sweet, 
Our backs cut up and sizzling, pus oozing out from heat, we worked the land, digging rows and trenches, mourned plantation losses, covering over with dirt and sand, praying rain eased the situation, knowing green grows thicker with blood. Today, that vast green remains only in spaces the 1800 fires couldn't catch. Spanish town residents sail over Caymanas estate on highways built by Chinese stopping over, docked in Kingston Harbor, ready to sail again, trading black lives for development. Green is not always measured in barrel or ton, how great houses in cherry gardens can become to own a people, the land. Politicians string up singing the same song, come to Willica Island, come borrow and steal, help you pay off another IMF deal. Three, but what is our affection with fiery friction? History records the burning of houses, attics preferably, in rebellion, in depression, in escape of foreign gloom. However, no one talks about the houses surrounded by green, landlocked by sea and poverty, the madness festering your insides, twist up like ivy vine or morning glory. Thank you. And this next one is called Considering Aesthetics in a Post-Colonial Kiss. Thin hair and a wispy frame, limbs frail from generations of absenteeism, your skin never adjusted to the harshness of the sun, which you regard as burning. So result, mm, let me start again. <laughs> Considering aesthetics in a post-colonial kiss. Thin hair and a wispy frame, limbs frail from generations of absenteeism. Your skin never adjusted to the harshness of the sun, which you regard as, which you regard as burning resulting in white flight, overseas landing here where cold is beauty. Soot and snow don't mix in this fecundity. We kiss, at the time blind by liquor and promises of a happy ever after. Love comes easier these days after two beers and a drunken walk back to yours. But what about the value of a kiss before burning before jumping, before marooning, your last breath before dying. Somehow it's a gateway into heaven, back against the current bound for home. I guess you cannot feel all the warmth my body holds from generations of cane cutting and sweat soaking and staining. Hot salty water dripping into the soil to grow tropical fruit and fauna that attracts your wandering eyes. The beauty that blossoms past shadows blooming overseas, docking into your bed. How easy it is to board a ship or plane, the golden cargo delivered. And perhaps, had it not been for your innate desire to conquer my body, both vessel and land, still holding the histories of our colonial past and post-colonial dependency, I might have pardoned the queen and allowed you to enter, sharing fruit and seed together, creating a new, but not so new shade of brown, similar to a green card or a renter dread. But the weight of my skin, too heavy to comprehend a fleeting moment, a simple pleasure, the joy that comes after conquer, a flag raised above the dead. I made it in England. Thank you. And for my final reading, I'll be doing an excerpt from um, my first short story, which is in pre, so in bookmarked. So um, it's called Cruising on Wrangler Avenue. So, couple hours later, the moon high up drawing a tide breeze to travel through the dense crowd on the beach, taming the fever. Everyone catching a good vibe with music and weed and liquor and girls. Jonah and Paul feeling well hot, enjoying themselves, and I try to make Feddy feel the spirit too, but he just hold his cup and sip every now and again. 
In the far corner side, a set of speakers, three older women spinning, spinning them waistline, holding steady on top of heels. All eyes them quick, fixing him stare on the one in the middle in a tight jeans, batty rider shorts, and shocking color pink mesh top with a black bra outer door and a navel ring to match. Come, let me mash them up now. One for the three away. And you grab a fresh beer from the bar and leave Fetty and Jonah behind, watching to see if you have skills for real. And between the ebb and flow of bodies passing between the bar, between the dance, between skin, sweat, and baseline, the Sipal talking and talking and leaning closer and closer. And Jonah see him pass something to the lady in pink who pocketed it and start strut between the excitement to meet the shy guy on the other side. So how you come? So how comes you and ask me for a dance? Shocking Pinky come right up in Feddy face and he smell all the liquor in our breath. And see some of her makeup mixing with her sweat and running down. And he wonder why she put on green eyeliner when that no match. But this was not Nadali House, and he fixed his stance real quick to play up a comeback above the music. I know you're looking my way. Shocking Pinky busts out a belly laugh and bend back far. And Feddy see that the men in the party eyes shift, looking under her and looking at him. He tried again. But you're looking real hot in them shots, girl. And Shocking Pinky shift her bumper and start to move it round and round, backing it up on the unsuspecting boy. And Feddy see he being watched by Paul from the speakers and Jonah from the bar who are shouting name and draw more crowd. So he take a big swig from him cup and grab her waistline and the two bodies meet somewhere in the middle between the rhythms. When somebody feel the way drowned and dead, they catch hold to the closest body and sink. But sometimes they let the water pull them down fast before anybody reach so they don't owe nothing in heaven. Feddy realized he can't keep up and his hands drop from her waist and start shake by his side. And he wonder if he to shift and move. Mm. Feddy realized he can't keep up and his hands drop from her waist and start shake by his side. And he wonder if he to shift and move him limp dick from between her crack. But she keep bouncing it. And he feel him free and getting weak and start wonder if he should just fall and take the beating that going come after, hoping he don't dead. Or Catch it by her waist and sink with the manhood able to stand tall because he find a way to tame the broad and level the waters. Luckily, the liquor reach him head and the side for him. So before him falter, he hauls shocking Pinky by her belt straps and she drops straight on him pants front and everybody reel up and form circle around them and Feddy eyes get wide because shocking Pinky still a jump and bubble on him and he wonder if this is what it going to feel like somewhere between a loud slap and soft ripple from water. And for a moment, he ready to dive deep and test him limits till the song trail off, select a change speed, and the crowd move back into a rhythm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caleb. In fact, can you all stand? We would like to give a round of applause to our scholarship winners. Thank you to Yashika Graham, Javante Anderson, Tanisia Pratt, and Caleb Diaguilar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep writing and we'll keep publishing you. Thank you. Okay, so as they exit the stage, I'm going to read a few words by the professor Shalini Puri, who wrote the foreword for Bookmarked, which some of you have purchased. And some of you have yet to, and that's fine. There are books available for you. And at the same time, we can have our next writers just start taking your seats, just for efficiency. Now let me read to you the words of Shalini Puri. Pre extends the scope of the debates in the present. A literary language that can hold Caribbean reality today must take stock of how digital culture mediates everyday life. Pre reimagines the disparate representations of Caribbean voices in, say, Brathwaite or Bennett or Selvon or Loveless or Dabadine or Collins or Keynes Douglas or Young or Agard or Sistrin in the context of an everyday life that is now saturated by social media. The literature in these pages bears the imprint of blog, flash fiction, email, Twitter. WhatsApp, Netflix, graffiti, and a host of visual media. 
and the sampling of visual art included here exemplifies the breathtaking interaction in pre between writing and experimental visuals from photography and video essay to painting, sculpture, and mixed media, from performance and installation art to public murals. Pre explores in literature the ways that patois and the hashtag literature and visual art are folded together and the new expressive possibilities that arise out of that contact. It celebrates the mutual shaping of literary and digital culture. As a platform that gathers together such writing, pre and bookmark make visible emerging literary patterns and lend them a collective energy. I thank Shalini Puri for those words, and I hope that that helps to make more sense of why we're in this kind of space, sharing space with a visual artist. So yes, please take your seats. It's time for round two. Okay. So I hope you've been able to process what we've shared with you so far today. It's been a lot. Perhaps we should have given you time to chat with a friend, but you can do that on your ride home. All right. Are you ready? Okay. So first up will be Diana McCauley. Now, Diana McCauley is an environmental activist and an award-winning writer. She was born, raised, and has lived all but a few school years in Jamaica. She's written quite a few novels, Dog Heart, Hurricane, Gone to Drift, and White Liver Gal. Her most recent book, though, is Daylight Come, published by People Tree Press in September 2020. Both Dog Heart and Huracan were shortlisted for the Sorayan Prize for International Writing and Gone to Drift, placed second in the 2015 BERT Prize for Caribbean Young Adult Literature. Now, as many of you know, she has written numerous columns for the Jamaican newspapers about environmentalism and the like. But you can go ahead and read more of her bio online because I think we want to get to the reading now, yes? So I stop there and I invite Diana McCauley to take the microphone. Thank you, Isis. Greetings, everybody. I'm really, really happy to be here. I'm going to read to you from my short story, Bridge Over the Yalas River, which recent, recently won the Caribbean Regional Short Story Writers Prize for 2022. And if you want to find out how it all comes out, because I can't read the whole thing, it's published online by Granta. So here's Bridge Over the Yalas River. When since thunderstorm mean disaster, thought Roy. He waited to count the seconds between lightning and thunder, assessing how far away the storm was. Rain pounded on the zinc roof, flash, flash, then a rolling boom that traveled from sky to earth and shook his bed. Six seconds, not that close. He couldn't hear his daughter's breathing, so he bent over her, feeling her breath feathering his cheek. A storm could cause her to have an asthma attack and the roads were probably already impassable. Dina began to wheeze. Sit up, pumpkin, Roy said, pulling her into his arms. Weigh your inhaler. Dina reached under her pillow, her eyes unfocused. She shook the inhaler, and it rattled. She breathed out and then sucked at it. Roy stroked her hair, just breathe. Storm soon pass. Flash, crash, eight seconds. Then they heard a mechanical, tearing, screeching sound over the rain. Must be the bridge, whispered Roy, more to himself than to Dina. Disaster had a shape and a date, he thought. He could just see Dina's chest rise, hitch, and fall in the dark. How long would the stuff in the inhaler last? Their house was higher than some, but how would he know if the river had burst its banks and they had to climb onto the roof? The rain eased just after dawn. He left Dina sleeping and went outside into a drizzle. The Yalas River was still a raging, roiling scar across the land. He had built his house on a slight slope and used concrete foundations to raise the floor, and it had never flooded. Not yet. He jumped onto a crumbling wall nearby, part of an old aqueduct, the elders said, and stood looking east over the community of Bacto 
towards the river. In the glow of dawn, he saw the bridge was really gone. Every resident of Bactu knew the story of the bridge, first built in slavery time. It had been cracked by an earthquake at the turn of the 20th century, and later that same year, a huge guango tree had been washed down by the rains, trapped by the bridge itself, and backed up the silt-laden floodwaters which then spread across the land. Public Works blew up the bridge because it was easier than taking out the tree. A new bridge was built, erected in less than a month, by shirtless black men supervised by sunburned white men wearing hard hats and orange vests. A Bailey Bridge, it was called, the elders said, a wondrous contraption of steel triangles and wooden planks much higher over the river than the old one. The Bailey Bridge was supposed to be temporary, but the people of Bactu thought it would be there forever, so modern and clean it was. And it did last for nearly 70 years, but slowly the riverbanks began to erode, caused by sand miners and loggers in the mountains and recurrent floods. And soon there was a trench across the road near to the posts that supported the bridge. Soon be bridged to no damn place, the people of Bactu muttered. Now the bridge was gone. No one would be able to cross the churning river for days until the waters subsided. There was a fording nearby, usable most of the year, because the Yalas River had been diverted to the city of Kingston until only a trickle was left. Roy jumped down from the wall to see it to his daughter's tea. The back to all age school was on the other side of the river, so there would be no school today. Two days later, the politicians and the works agency people from Kingston and the bosses from the limestone quarry above back to came to see the river without a bridge. They shook their heads and shouted into their phones. Roy and Jonesy watched them from a safe distance. Maybe there would be work. But the water level fell day after day, and soon even one of the small Mazdas could use the fording. People began to cross on foot. Work at the quarry stopped, and the politicians and government people did not return. Fuckers, said Jonesy. Them don't give one shit about the likes of we. Four months after Public Works blew up what was left of the Bailey Bridge and it washed out to the sea, where it remained, a resting place for seabirds, Roy heard that the bridge was going to be rebuilt so the quarry could open. He went looking for Jonesy. Look like them hiring for the new bridge, Roy said, from the door of the Rankin Feisty Bar. Jonesy looked over his shoulder. So me here, but his foreigner going to be lit. Chinese or Mexican, he turned back to his red stripe. I go and give it a try still. No steady work since last time them fix it. If it's Chinese people may hear so them work you hard and pay you small. Roy laughed. Jonesy, what work you ever do that not hard and pay small? Is work, argument done. Jonesy grunted. Them wait too late. Foolishness to start bill before the hurricane season. You're coming or what? Can't hurt, said Jonesy, draining his beer. They had been friends since childhood, both born in back to a community of chaka chaka zinc roof and plywood houses, solid concrete homes in government schemes, cook shops, rum bars, the all-age school, a Methodist church, an Anglican church, and the Church of the Living Ascension set on a narrow plain between the mountains and the sea. The riverbed meandered over the plain, straightened and reinforced by gabion baskets in places, between crumbling banks in others, more sandy pathway than river most of the time. Jonesy had recently returned after two years with his grandmother in country, something to do with a fuss with a fisherman. Roy had never asked his friend about it. Their boyhood pact was to kick a football around the dusty play field built by the quarry company, to look for rare river pools higher up that might still contain fish, to pick and sell red coat plums and naseberries and stringy mangoes, but never to fast in each other's business. Their pact had held. Where them hiring, Jonesy asked as they walked. He smelled of beer and weed. It was not yet 10 o'clock. He staggered a little, and Roy steadied him. Community center, you go change your shirt, put on a hat? 
have a bath you wanted to say but didn't. For what? Just, you know, dress better, maybe we get the job if we clean up. If I had a job digging trench and carrying steel and cement, Jonesy was scornful. Better them see this. He flexed his, flexed his biceps and struck a pose. You too fool fool. Well, me I got change. Me tat me squeeze. And no one had heard of asthma. But Roy knew the dust came from progress. His nose ran, const ran, ran constantly. His sinuses throbbed and his eyes scratched. But dust was money. Papa is on the lanai, drinking in front of Caleb again. The man wouldn't even touch a red stripe when we were growing up, so I don't know why he would take up this habit in his old age. Then again, from my eyes, in the north, the blue mountain is a large looming rock, another planet crashing into ours. Caleb is not done. So why you drink rum, Grandpa? Papa leads forward and clasps his hands as if he's about to tell a story or some good gossip. Well, when grandpa drink, he's only as old as he feels. But when I don't drink, I just feel old. Papa laughs at his own joke, and Caleb loves it. Children never hear the hurt pressing up against the punchline. A child's ear is not tuned to irony, and secrets are slippery on their lips. One day when he's older, I might tell Caleb what happened. A baby born on the other side of an apocalypse cannot imagine the things his mother has seen. Papa groans, gets up and goes inside. Ten minutes from now, he'll be sneaking another drink. God knows this old house has so many cracks and corners you can hide a flask or two in plain sight. I sit on the lounge chair, his backside left warm. Caleb climbs into my lap. The lights of Kingston blaze all the way south until they disappear into a strip of shadow on the very edge of the city. This gray area deepens to black as land becomes liquid. Only the lowest stars on the horizon show you where sea turns into sky. I shiver and hold Caleb close. Jody was three years old at the time. My daughter had only sketchy memories of what happened until the night Papa filled in the blanks for her while under the influence. She cried, and after that I watched the light go out in her eyes. She knows all the details now, but like me, she still goes out to look out over Kingston, perhaps to imagine or to reimagine as children often do. I swear every time my daughter comes back inside, she is a little farther away from me. She's 10. My husband thinks I can only protect my children for so long from the truth. Patrick means well, but he doesn't know the nightmare. He lived up here on the hill when the whole thing went down. We started a farm further up the slope for self-reliance sake. Never mind that for now it's only potatoes, spinach, and a patch of purple skunk for Patrick to either smoke or sell. We have a drill for everything, a drill for alerting the neighbors to climb us, another one for the wildfires we get during the summer. The internet is a brother some advice. Caleb, you can always, they would think my husband and I were having some late night fun. I pull the covers off him, drape them over my head, and step out onto the lanai, a floral ghost. I look past the city lights to the gray area. There are memories out there in the dark. Red tomatoes and fresh cucumbers, coronation market with my mother, Hellshire Bre Beach on a Sunday with Papa and my sisters. How I would stay at Victoria Pier with my girls from high school until the moon came up and turned the ocean into blue suede and sequins. Me meeting a boy in a fishing boat going to Port Royal. It's easy to forget these things. 2.20 a.m., Papa is awake. He stumbles out onto the lanai. I don't have to look around to know he has a glass in his hand. I don't take it, but I give him a lecture. You're planning to stay sick, Papa? He's always ready with the answer. That's what you're out here fretting about. Are you looking out for what Patrick called them, climbers? Or is it the same boring husband you're trying to get away from? He sits down and leans towards me, whispering, Papa, you're talking about the same man who not only gave me my place, gave me and my kids a place to live, but took in my father as well. Matters not. This man can't love you like that boy. You tell your mother you meet in Port Royal. What's him name? Troy. My children's father was a good man, did his best at JPS, went to Canada on a program and worked two winters in Saskatchewan, and we saved the money. I earned a degree while pregnant and taking care of my first child. 
eventually Troy and I find a place in Portmore, we would have moved out of Ellison Road the following day if it weren't for what happened that night, starting with a WhatsApp message at a quarter past 11. 7.5 earthquake off the coast of Honduras, tsunami watch in effect for Kingston. The map looks terrifying enough. It's a rash of pulsating red dots between Central America and the islands. Scroll up. Under the map is a table with Caribbean cities and the expected time of arrival for each wave. It doesn't take long for a counter text to come in. Tsunami warning are hoax, fake news. And in two hours, the warning is jostling for space on WhatsApp and losing to the fake news text, texts about the fake news text, and funny videos of macaroni, the accident-prone Jamaican man. Troy gets off the call with a co-worker. Raquel, I'm taking this serious. And that's how we end up in a JPS truck after midnight searching for the tallest, strongest building this side of town, even as a dance hall session hot over Raytown and people walk around like any other ordinary Friday night. The two security guards think we're funny or stupid. Fake news, that man. You know, see the text. Go on, what I do? We can put you up on YouTube. And they allow us to get on top of a building that is the central sorting office, a concrete cube 70 feet high that helps us feel safer. Instead, I feel like a damn fool with a pregnant belly, a sleeping picnic, and a baby bag scrambling onto the roof from a dirty JPS truck bucket on a big, big Friday night. People pass, point, and shoot. Traffic on South Camp Road slows down. Across the street, a man sits astride his Yang Yang bike beside graffiti on a wall. It says, keep cartel, free bujo. The man smokes a cigarette. He's not the only one fuming. A vex has ras. A vex with Tony. A vex with a utility truck bucket disappeared down the side of the building. Vex when I watch him drive away to go back for the stuff we packed up for no reason. Vex until I look towards the harbor and all of a sudden, I cannot remember what I vex about. All I know is I cannot see the lowest stars touching the horizon. It's as if something came and tore away the bottom part of the sky. In Raytown, the drum and bass shuts down and there is a strange kind of quiet when you unplug a sound system. Only distant screaming comes from the houses now. Meanwhile, up on the roof of the central sorting office, videos are going viral. Fishermen film seawater retreating about a half a mile in the harbor. There's another clip with fish floundering in Yalas. We look up from our phones. Windward Road is exploding with blue lights and sirens. Police cars zip up and down South Camp Road with warnings. Something wide, something dark is swallowing the airport and snuffing out the lights of Port Royal. Kingston Harbor is foaming white. It looks like something glowing. Every sound surrenders to the sea climbing up on land. It is a noise that gets into your knees first, a rush, like all the clouds crashing down, crushing zinc roofs. And under that battering is a bang of metal, the clatter of wood, and a million plastic bottles suspended in brine, reflux from what we have fed the ocean. More screams as loud as the one in your mind. No, not here. This cannot happen here. The man on the Yang Yang bike tosses a cigarette and takes off towards Sabina Park like a madman, and water surges everywhere. Missing no target, hundreds run, chased by a shadow. Black ink spills into downtown and lurches up a slope carrying vehicles. Utility poles snap, sparks rain down, and the crowd disappears when the ocean takes it from behind. The froth is leaping over houses, erasing roads, sweeping away landmarks we know and slamming flesh into walls. Police cars are in the mix, overturned. Blue lights still flashing. Fishing boats cross the intersection, disobeying the stoplight. In minutes, the gas station goes under and there are no chain link fences anymore. More make it to the roof crying out for Jesus. A woman shrieks for Kemar, stretching both hands over the side of the building. People hold her back. She falls. Phones come out and still shoot her, holding her womb. Kemar. She's dirty from lying down. It is still posted. Jody wakes up to see stars instead of a ceiling. She hears a roar from below, and she will not be consoled. With her in my arms and Caleb kicking me from the inside, I search for Troy in the crowd, and the security guards last saw him in the parking lot, hurrying children into a JPS truck bucket. And when a disaster happens in the dark, you fear even daylight. The sun has no business rising to shine on shame. A retreating tsunami is a stinking thing that brings the worst to the surface. Innocence is in the water. 
toys, slippers, a casket ripped from its resting place, thrown open to the light. Later, scores of them will swirl around us from the Ellison Cemetery, cholera cemetery they call it. A man weeps, his friend explains. Gotta forget rid of the wicked. Montego be a feel it too. Kingston's drains could not handle it, they say. The wave went up the sandy gully and left salt and shipping containers all over the city. Two containers bang into our building, one bright orange, the other green. They sound empty. Pigeons crowd the roof, wondering where their homes went. And there are no roads anymore, so we are officially at sea. A yang yang bike is fastened to the top of a tree. Out on the lanai, Papa is still talking about Troy. He sees the salt water in my eyes. Cheer up, Raquel. It's not the end of the world. Your husband is a real ass, but at least you live uptown now. My eyes shoot shut. Live your life, take care of my grandchildren, even when things look salt. Caleb wakes up. He's calling out from the room. My memories take a break. 4.20, mommy, 4.20. And I rush inside and look at the time, confused. Patrick is awake and on the CB radio talking fast. Answers crackle back. Caleb is pointing out the window. The hillside is red with flames. Fuck the codes. Wildfire Patrick. He stomps into the room to correct me. Wildfires, the worst. Authorities saying, get out. He has his firearm and is rummaging in a duffel bag for ammunition. Get the kids and I hope your father not drunk tonight. We need fingers on triggers. We're putting together a team to lead the push into the hills. Traveling in, another joins in. Skyward, the road might be blocked further up the ridge. Visibility is going to be zero with all the smoke. Your copy, Skyward? The kids are up and moving. Papa is packing liquor from all his secret places. And meanwhile, Patrick is at a standstill, clutching the radio, unmoving. I reach for the CB microphone. He looks at me and lets go, and the words are somewhere in my throat. I don't know who is on the other end and how many people are listening, but I look out to the lanai and across the city to the gray area between the lights and the liquid, downtown Kingston. I press the microphone key, and my voice comes back to me. There is a place. It's not far from here. Thank you. Too close for comfort. Mm. Thank you, Roland. So our next reader is Kai Miller, who is a multi-award winning Jamaican poet and writer. He's written several books across a range of genres. His 2014 poetry collection, The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion, won the Forward Prize for Best, um, won the Forward Prize uh, for Best Collection. His 2017 novel, August Town, won the Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature, the Prix Les Afriques, and Prix Cabet de la Caribe d'Etude du Monde. That was pretty good French. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, in 2010, the Institute of Jamaica awarded him the Silver Musgrave Medal for his contributions to literature, and in 2018, he was awarded the Anthony Sabga Medal for Arts and Letters. In his latest work, Things I Have Withheld, Kai Miller explores the meanings of silence using provocative and lyrical essays. We give thanks as we welcome Kai Miller. Hi, everyone. You all right? Great. All right, I'm just going to read three poems from the last collection of poetry in nearby bushes. And so this, the three poems are going to come from a section called Here, and that all the poems begin like that. So, here where blossoms the night. Uh, the whole poem, by the way, I mean, if I was reading this to an American audience or a British audience, I'd have to explain about Nanny and her secret powers. But we all know that, so when that reference come up, you know, yeah. Uh, and if the name sounds strange, I'm just exploring this plot of land. You know, call it the nearby bushes. I'm exploring the landscape of Jamaica, and it's just a list of all the wonderful names that we name plants and fauna. All right? 
So here where blossoms the night. Here where blossom the orchids, 220 in variety, some have adapted to bone dry places to being purple amongst the stone. Here where blossom Jamaican ladies of the night, I mean the flowers, their petals, the color of weddings, their perfume, the scent of parlors. There is much that blossoms in these bushes and much that rots. Like Jamaican ladies of the night, I no longer mean the flowers. Here where grows the hog apple, the hog money. Here where wild hogs rot at the roots of things. The trees sometimes are grunting. Here where you can find the tuna. Here the monkey's hand, the cow's tongue. Such things seem not to belong to bushes, but they are as much a part as the bullock's heart, the dog's tail, as much a part as the broken bottles and burnt cars is that the right way to say it especially here should i have said the heap of rock battle and the plenty bun up car here that cannot be held by the small arms of language here that cannot be held by the small arms of english here that cannot be held by the english but how they tried here is where they found nanny or where nanny found them where you might find her still if you believe in Kumina, the never dead of spirits, Nanny. Do you know her story? Her peculiar ability to catch bullets and where? Some say she could even shoot them back, but I think this was just a metaphor for the magnificent stink of her farts, that coming across a white man, she could just lift up her frock tail and clear the bush of English hair, where is the inscrutability, the wild and passionate uproar hair, where is the horror, the horror hair, where you might find the war hair, where blossoms the knife hair, where blossoms the blood laid here where glistens the blood the wild mint grows here and the wild pawpaw and the wild sage and the wild caesar obia so much wildness can be found here where creeps the ceracy the love bush that strangles trees here where shines the raw moon raw moon being folk etymology original word ramoon here where you will find the much improved names of things, the slow greening and rooting of Latin, semen contra becomes semi-contract, semper vivum becomes simple Bible, becomes single Bible. Let the trees say amen here, where blossoms the ginger here, where blossoms the danger here, where you must pray against the loud bark of cedar, seek God in the orchids, ask help of archangels, though here, archangels are only flowers, their petals, the color of weddings, their perfume, the scent of parlors, by which I mean the heavily powdered dead, this landscape like a wreath laid against itself. Here where blossoms the natto, here where blossoms the nettle, here where blossoms the night. Oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, again, if I was reading to um, a foreign audience, I'd have to explain the background to this, but I assume most of you know some of it. Um, and usually I'd be very dismissive about how this process came about, but I feel this is the kind of audience where probably one, <clears throat> one of you in here is responsible for this, so I'll be kind of. But in the mid-1980s, someone had the great idea to bring six reindeer to Jamaica <laughs> for a Christmas show. Makes sense, right? Yeah? So they bring the six reindeer, you know, vixen, prance, whatever. And they had them there for the show. Christmas done, what to do with the deer. So they take them to Somerset Falls in Portland. And they were there, you know, part of a petting zoo, blah, blah, blah. 1988, 
run up in the hills, and of course, them do what Maroons do. They form community, they build family, they breed. So at the time of writing this poem, uh, and a rough estimate of the population of deer in the hills of Portland was around 6,000 from that initial six. And I think now it's around 8,000. Here we run the wild deer. Here we run the wild deer, the Caribbean caribou. Does this surprise you? Dare without snow, not even the possibility of snow here. They are like echoes of a long story, the brutal history of this place, which is not to say they are not their own stories, but that they know, as we do, the tightness of ships and how to lose whole continents and how to be wary of white men wielding whips and how to end up here. There is such a thing as the perfect storm. It includes an actual storm and deer in weak cages and the nearby bushes. How wonderful to escape into hills that have always been escape. They are the new maroons. At dawn, they descend on quiet hooves to loot from the estates. But maybe that isn't fair. I shouldn't say estates, but farms. On the seven o'clock news, a man spreads his arms to show the field of ruined carrots. Have mercy, them name every God Almighty thing. And then he faces camera but is looking somewhere beyond the absent harvest, his mind lighting on memory. But Jesus Christ, he breathed, them so pretty, his face now a curious thing as if ashamed or puzzled. He should recognize such beauty where dried branches may not be dried branches, but the majesty of antlers hair, where white flowers may not be white flowers, but the blossoming of their tails, the strange warning of dare we do not see well, but we sense you are here with us in this strange, strange land. Will you come now to the river? Will you teach us King Alpha's song and how to survive Babylon, how to belong where we do not belong? And the last poem I'll read is, I was thinking about the bushes as places of um, where we can get healing. Um, and so as, you know, just looking at and talking to lots of uh, these women who are bush healers. And this isn't why the poem came out. I'm just telling you why the poem begins like this. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of diseases that have a color in it, you know, like yellow fever or black plague or, you know. And, this woman is talking about this bush, and she says it is good for black tube. And I couldn't work it out, and I felt ashamed, and I realized, here where is the cure? Here where is the cure for black tube? And you had to ask, please, Miss Beatrice, what is black tube? And though her words were patient, her eyes said something different. Is born your born stupid or is university turn your fool? Bl black tube, she explains, is when woman can't get pregnant. Here, you must make adjustment for the greener sound of things. Blocked tubes, black tube, same thing. Here... Here, the strangest cure for stuttering, it goes like this. Sorry, it goes like this, collect rainwater in a calabash, beat it with a wooden pe pestle. Though some splashing is inevitable, be careful not to lose much water. Now drink one teaspoon each morning and soon you will find the balance of your tongue, your speech as smooth as song. Here, where is the cure for belly hat? 
and you didn't even have to ask, please, Miss Beatrice, what is belly hat? You have made adjustment for the greener sound of things, not belly ache, not belly hurt, but belly hat. Now boil donkey weed with collie mint in a clean pot. Sweeten, if you must, with honey. Here, where grows the standing body, the strong back. This is cure for weak man with useless mm, uh, heart. Search me heart is for weak heart. Eye bright is for weak eye. Scorn the earth is medicine for woman. Its name is its instruction. Plant most heaven bound. Its powers are diminished if it touches ground. Here, where is the cure for teeth? Here, where is the cure for grudgeful? Here, where is the cure for the picnic you never want? I dare not write these remedies down, but their ingredients grow here amongst the orchids, amongst the deer that sound like doors in the wild and blossoming night. Here, where is the cure? Thank you. Thank you, Kai. All right, moving along. Next is a multi-award winning Jamaican writer, Marlon James. He is the author of the 2005 novel, John Crow's Devil, and the novel, The Book of Night Women, which won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize. His novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, won the 2015 Man Booker Prize, making James the first Jamaican author to take home the UK's most prestigious literary award. He is the author of the Dark Star Trilogy, which includes Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and Moon Witch, Spider King. And you may have seen him out and about in Kingston lately, filming for his HBO series, Get Millie Black. And he's also a music lover. Welcome, Marlon. Thank you, Isis, and thank you, Pri. Thank you guys for coming out. So I'm going to read from um, Brief History. There's a character in it called Arthur George Jennings. And um, a lot of people don't know who he is in real life. And I've pretty much stayed away from telling people who my characters really are. But I was at University of Chicago, and a professor of Chinese studies come to me, came to me and said, um, Arthur George Jennings is my granduncle. Grand uncle. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's not. And then he whispered his surname, and I go, yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. <laughs> All I'll tell you is the character's nieces are published authors in London. That's all I'm going to tell you. The two people I'm going to reveal, though, in this section I write about, I talk about two women, the woman in Manhattan and the woman in Kingston. The woman in Kingston is Judy Moa. She doesn't know that she's in this book. Um, the woman in Manhattan is Maxine Walters. And the reason why they're in it is they both told me the same story, and they have no idea they told me the same story. So I, at some point, that story will come up in this. So this is Arthur George Jennings, and he's a ghost. And if he's talking to you, it means you're either dead or you soon die. So he's talking to Bob Marley. Now something new is blowing in through the air, an ill wind, a malaria. Still more will have to suffer, and many more will have to die. Two, three, a hundred, eight hundred and eighty-nine. Meanwhile, I see you whirling like a dervish under the rhythm and above it, jumping up and down the stage, always landing on your brutus toe. Years before on the football field, a player wearing running spikes, who plays football in running spikes, stomped on your cleats and slashed the toe. When you were still a boy, you nearly sliced it in two with a hoe. A cancer is a rebellion. A cell gone rogue against the body with turncoats turning the other way and seducing parts of you to do the same. I will divide your parts and conquer. I will shut down limb one by one and spill poison in your bones because look, there is nothing in me but darkness. No matter how many times your mother wrapped it in gauze and sprinkled it with gold bond medicated powder, your toe was never going to heal. 
something new is blowing. You're in the studio with the band making a new tune. Clock ticks by in Jamaica time. Watch us take two hits of the Collieweed and pass on the left. Two guitar leads wrap around each other, coiling tight like a snake fight. The new guitarist with shorter dreads, the rocker who loves Hendrix, plugs out. You shoot him a quick look with your eyes wide open. Don't leave, but don't have enough time. You are playing football in Paris, in the green field below the Eiffel Tower. You play with anyone up for a game. Starstruck white boys and that man from the French national team. Your crew, even years after touring, never get used to it, cities that never sleep. They are sluggish, even though that's the afternoon. The French do not play like the British, none of this single player peacock business. These boys move like a unit, even though most have never met before. One of them makes a bad play, steps hard on your right toe, and tears the nail off. You are in London. Cut off that toe. Cut it off right now, the doctor says, without looking you in the face. Stuff those boots with tissue, with a cotton, with, with putting, and mums the word. The room smells of antiseptic thrown on shit to mask it, and of iron, as if somebody in the next ward is scouring steel pots. But Rasta already think a lame toe is a curse from God. What will they think of an amputated one? You are in Miami. The doctor cuts out the spot and grafts skin from the left foot. It's a success, he says, but not with those words. You can't remember those words exactly. But he says your cancer is gone. You have no cancer. And every night you stomp down Babylon from stage, your right foot, your right boot, fills near to the brim with blood. You're in New York. It's September 21. Everybody knows you're always the first to wake up and the last to go to sleep, especially in the studio. Nobody notices that you haven't done either in a year. You wake up burning. The mattress has sucked two pounds of water from your skin, but you can hear the air conditioner humming somewhere near you. You think of the pain on the right side of your head, and it's there. Now you wonder if the pain was just a thought until you thought about it. Or maybe the pain was in you for so long that it became an unseen part of the body, a mole hidden between toes. Or maybe you did speak a curse into being like the old woman up in the hills would say. You do not know it's September 21. You have no memory of the second show the night before. You have no idea who you are, where you are, and who is here with you. But at least you know you're in New York. You're jogging around Central Park South. Different country, same crew. And for a second, you feel as if you're back in Buff Bay before sunrise. A run, on black, a run on black sand beach, a dip in the waterfalls, maybe some football, working up a healthy appetite for breakfast, all cooked by Gilly, and waiting for you to get back. But you're still in New York, and humidity is already sweeping in. You lift your left leg high, widening your stride before it hits the dirt, but your right leg refuses to move. Your hips swing, and oh, what kind of fuck critics? But your right leg just won't move. Lift it without thinking, that doesn't work. Lift it with thinking, that doesn't work either. And now your left leg won't move. Both legs stall, even after you have commanded them with three bumble clots. Your friend is coming up behind you and you turn to call out, but your neck twists half, about half inch and locks. Nobody nodding yes, no nodding no. A scream vanishes on the way from your throat to your lips. Your body's leaning and you can't stop it. No, it's not leaning, it's toppling. Now you cannot stretch your arms to break the fall. The ground slams into you face first. You wake up in the Essex house. Hands and feet recover, but the fear lingers. Too weak to leave the bed, so you don't know they lied to your wife. Only minutes before and turned her away. You wake up and smell sex, smoke, and whiskey. You see and wait, but nobody listens, nobody looks, nobody comes. Your ears wake up to friends running up charges to their hotel room, friends snorting foot after foot of cocaine, friends fucking groupies, friends fucking whores, friends fucking friends, Rastaman on freebase raping the chillum pipe. Men in suits, men on the make, businessmen drinking your wine, your room a temple waiting for Jesus to scour, or some prophet, or any prophet. 
but you sink in the bed, thankful that at least you can move your neck. Brooklyn boys pass by with guns, Rastafari all doused out. You have no strength to stand, no lips to curse, so you whisper, please close the door. But nobody hears, and when Essex House bloats and bursts, the friends spill into 7th Avenue. You collapse in Pittsburgh. It's never a good thing when doctors talk using a word that ends with Oma. The Oma has hopped, skipped, and jumped from your foot to your liver, lungs, and brain. In Manhattan, they blast you with radium and your locks drop and scatter. You go to Miami, then Mexico, to the clinic that could not save Steve McQueen. November 4, your wife arranges a baptism in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Somebody's driving you through Bavaria, near the Austrian border. A hospital sprouting out of forests like magic, hills in the background, rippled with snow like cake icing. You meet the tall and frosty Bavarian, the man who helps the hopeless. He smiles, but his eyes are set too far back, and they vanish in the shadow of his brow. Cancer is a red alert that the whole body is in danger, he says. Thank God that the food he forbids, Rastafari had forbidden a long time. A sunrise is a promise. But the Bavarian bows out. Nobody speaks of hope. Nobody speaks of anything. You are in Miami with no memory of the flight. May 11, eyes open. You're the first one up, just like old times. But all you see are old woman's hands, overrun with black veins and bony, jutting kneecaps. A plastic machine with veins pushed into your skin, all doing the living for you. You already feel like sleep, probably from all the drugs, but this one comes on like a creeper, and you, don't, you, don't, and you already know that wherever you go this time, there is no coming back. Something coming from the window, something like the Stevie Wonder tune, Master Blaster. In New York City and in Kingston, both skies blaze bright with noon white. Thunder breaks out and lightning bolt slashes across the clouds. Summer lightning, three months too early. The woman waking up in Manhattan and the woman sitting on that porch in Kingston, they both know you're gone. Four priests cover their faces with lightning, speaking a liturgy nobody out in the congregation knows. Every dis disciple wrote a testament, but not every testament in the Bible. A man says to a woman who does not understand, 10 seats down, 30 seats across in the national arena. The singer's funeral. Gospel and heresy go in a dogfight over the body. Rastaman chants from Corinthians, even though the elders told him to speak from Psalms. And all 10 sit while he calls a king God. Heresy. The Ethiopian Orthodox Archbishop says, why go to Africa when it would profit you more to, to build a better life in Jamaica? The Rastafarians seethe and cuss. The Archbishop came with weapons too. Every Rastafarian wants to wake up in Shashimani land, 500 acres of land bestowed by a deposed emperor. Defiant Rastas shout, Ja Rastafari. Only a few asking, why is this an Ethiopian Orthodox funeral when the singer was Rasta? Hundreds sit and stand and watch. The old prime minister, still beloved by the sufferers, sits still, hum hunched over his knee, hunched over in loss. The new prime minister sits up until called. He gives a trilogy for a man he barely knew, but closes with a benediction. May he, may he forever, may his soul find rest in the arms of Jarastafari. Gospel versus heresy, heresy wins. How do you bury a man? Put him in the ground or stomp out his fire. They give the singer an honor on his deathbed, the order of merit. The black revolutionary joins the order of British squires and knights, Babylon in excelsis. A fire that lit up Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, and South Africa, doused out by two letters, O and M. Now he's one of us. But the singer, he is sly. In time, people will see that he prophesied over this very thing singing of the fall's honor before it was bestowed on him, before sickness took him. I hear him singing in his sleep, 
about Negro soldiers in Africa, black American soldiers of the 24th and 25th Infantry, and the 9th and 10th Cavalry, under the command of the Pale Face to butcher Comanche, Kiowa, Sioux, Cheyenne, Uti, and Apache. 14 black men in dirty boots take the Medal of Honor for killing people and an idea. The Indians call them Buffalo Soldiers. The Medal of Honor, the Order of Merit, the same sounds flipped. Meanwhile, I see the singer coming in and going out on the top right side of parcels and letters, and I am out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlon. All right, so our final reader will be Stacey Ann Chin. Poet, actor, and performing artist Stacey Ann Chin is the author of the poetry collection Crossfire, A Litany for Survival. The critically acclaimed memoir, The Other Side of Paradise, co-writer and original performer in the Tony Award winning Russell Simmons Death Poetry Jam on Broadway, and author of the one woman shows Hand Afire, Hands Afire, Unspeakable Things, Border Clash, and Motherstruck. She proudly identifies as Caribbean, black, Asian, lesbian, woman, and, may I add, community activist and farmer at Kindred on the Rock, an intentional community of radical, progressive, inclusive thinkers and doers who believe there is value to be harnessed from a deep engagement with the earth and the bounties it provides for our survival. Her words, not mine. Thank you, Stacey Ann. How you holding up is a long fucking reading. <laughs> we must be literary lovers, right? Um, so I'm gonna read a poem because Everybody who knows me knows when you say, hi, Stacy, I go, no, never Stacy, always Stacy Ann. Um, and then when you go foreign, people always try to truncate your name. I don't know if you, what your names are, but like Americans like call you like Candy and all kind of names that your mother never named you. Um, And this one too for the trans community who is consistently asking us to reorder our minds in terms of what we knew them, what we called them. And um, as they struggle, I mean, I suppose this is a common struggle between myself and that community. Call me by my whole name, my entire name. Put your belly, your throat, you're back into it, all of it. This label I have asked you to acknowledge means something to me, to my family, to my mother. It meant I would carry something of her life, her survival, her dream for my illegitimate face. I should stop here to tell you that my middle name is Mar Shree. My mother, my mother was trying to give me the French name Ma Cherie, but she couldn't spell French. So she named me Marshri because that's how she could spell it. This name reminds me I am racing with myself and the whole world designed for my failure. My name keeps me at this race, pitting all my power against a system set up to make me fall, fail. My mother knew this when she gave me a name that required effort. If you remember to say it right, you will never forget my face, my fury at the inequities, the unutterable differences between children with recognizable names and the ones who never hear their heritage out loud, the ones who are never proud of where they live, where they come from, where they are likely to return. My mother knew that names matter in the large scheming of things. When she is dead, I will think of her every time someone sounds out all my name. Note the story of why she chose this grouping of letters predisposed to cracking People are not always willing to hold the whole of you in name and nature. Women who insist they are called by their whole names served up in pieces when we are whole. Most women choke on such delicacies. The shrapnel, the broken teeth, the bones that never set properly, split hairs curling too tightly, unpainted fingernails jagged and bent, my heart breaks are embedded in my name. Names the lovers have called me exquisite, whore, 
devil, witch, OCD bitch, banji bitch, motherfucker bitch. Some of them used my name to beg me not to leave. Others of them begged me, please leave. They accused me sometimes of things I didn't do, things I did. You are far too intense, girl. I need me something easy. Rest yourself, woman. The world will take care of herself. I would live a quieter life without the noise of you. I would be better off without the difficulty of your never-ending name. Can't we just call you something shorter, something broken, maybe something splintered? It would just be easier that way. It takes all of my self-control not to only say, no, you may not shorten my name, you mealy mouth shortcut taking underexposed apathetic cocksucker. This two-spirit name holds all my history, navigating immigration officers and lovers who cheated on me and lovers who I cheated on and surviving an assault mounted by a mob of 12 little dick dudes who decided a girl who looked like me shouldn't be eating this much pussy on campus. This name is my father in his artful denial. This name is an albatross. It's an anchor. It's an angry retort when upper class white people in America hear my accent and forget that I am only one slave ship removed from my American, my African American counterparts. But for the history housed in this name, I might be nobody. I would have nothing except a few jagged, ragged consonants rigged to sound like a broken record of disconnection. So forgive me when I ask you to call me by my whole name to wrap your lazy tongue round this cluster of ineloquent consonants combined to create a weapon, double-barreled and dangerous, taken or given. This is the name I prefer. It is the name I insist on and not the one created by your lazy, inarticulate tongue. So, um, and this one, this one I, This one I write for um, Jamaicans who um, have the particular weirdness of loving Kenny Rogers. <laughs> and so with lighter skin, yes, hair straighter, but we were similar enough to see ourselves in each other, both hurt enough by the world to fiercely love each other. He loved me grudgingly. I adored him like an eager pup loves a reluctant owner. In charge of everything we did, my brother made me sing country music like we was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. We spent whole afternoons begging, Ruby, don't take your love to town, singing daytime friends and nighttime lovers like old drunks reliving tragic lives. But he loved the gambler best of all. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You never count your money. When you're sitting at the table, there'll be time enough for counting. When the dealing's done, he sang the gambler like he was Kenny Rogers himself. I couldn't understand why he loved that song so much, but I would have followed this boy everywhere. So just to please him, I used to sing The Gambler with gusto. When I was nine years old, he was 11, my mother returned, separated us, sent him to Mount Salem, left me in a place called Paradise and disappeared. The distance between my brother and me, only two miles, might as well have been 2,000. We became single children of Sisyphus, pushing the rock of abandonment up disparate mountains. No more Kenny Rogers. He switched to reggae. I listened to Melissa Etheridge, Sarah McLaughlin, Michelle and Dege Ocello. We both tried so hard to remain close, but our love was never meant to survive, never meant for holiday dinners and lasting relationships. Our lives was marked for infrequent, awkward reunions laced with sorrow. We lived every day pushing against a deep desire for love, needing people but guarding against it. Such is a delicate wiring of emotional dysfunction. 
The few good times we had were complicated, rare, magical. Circa 1999, we found compromise in Mariah Carey, speeding 100 miles per hour on the autobahn. Windows down, we sang into the cold night. Felt so alone. Suffered from alienation, happy as I was. I remember thinking being a lesbian will one day cost me my first love, my brother, this boy, the only boy whose opinion of me ever really mattered. I needed my brother to love me, but I also needed him to know me. So I took a chance, baited fate, and I told him all about the girlish collisions on campus, the tacit lovers who went with me to illegal house parties in Jamaica, the pretty girls residing in the smallest closets on campus. I couldn't be silent about any of it. I told my brother everything about the boys who assaulted me, about their hands and their fingers, their fists. And he listened, he listened, he listened. And then he said, but you're my sister, so none of that don't matter. And my almost twin, both of us discarded, both half-breeds, both seeds of my mother's ill-conceived Ill youth. Only two years apart, my brother, who had no reason to, told me that he gonna love me anyways. My Jamaican boy, raised on a stout diet of violent homophobia, said, you is my sister, man, so it don't matter. And I didn't quite know how to show him how lucky I felt to be his little sister. I wanted to sing the gambler to him right there and then. I believed then that our bond would survive everything. We loved each other hard as we could, ill-matched as siblings, witnesses to each other's pain. We developed a routine of sustainability. Whenever we disagreed about anything, he would mostly walk away, and I would mostly not let him. At each fracture, I would remind the boy that we was all we had, that we had survived our mother, that we could survive anything. So the last time we argued, I was surprised how swiftly the tables turned without warning. And you never see these things coming. In an instant, we were children again, forced to make beauty out of tragedy. The house of cards we'd constructed collapsed, hurt and unable to find a way forward. My brother and I both folded, bound and broken by all we had endured. We found ourselves unable to hold each other, angry and intractable. My big brother walked all the way away, and this time, I let him. It's poetic that the contention was about our children. This irony proves everything about parenting and progeny. Generational trauma cannot be sidestepped. Today there is nothing but sadness between us. I know nothing of his life. I imagine he knows nothing of mine except what he might find inside these public, private posts online. Our childhood is now no more than a silent scream except for the odd memory triggered by an old playlist cartwheeling me back to us as children, unwittingly belting out our future. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. This last one I'm gonna give you is called Tweet This Motherfucker. <laughs> so, Last poem. Anybody else notice that since the advent of the internet, because some of us are old enough to know that there was a before the internet. So I feel like before the internet, people used to be, you know, you would have to get some balls to come say some shit to me. But now you're just like on my page saying mad fucked up shit to me. You realize that that's, is that your experience? Um, and so this one I wrote because when I had my kid, you know, I was like fierce and activist and was like killing everybody and like was fierce and activist and killing everybody. I was fierce, you know, just fierce. And um, then I had a kid and then, you know, everything about the kid was cute. And I was like, oh my God, her poop is so cute. Like her feet are so cute, everything. Like, I, you know, I couldn't imagine myself being angry about anything. And then this guy online tweeted, you're a dirty carpet munching 
cunt that belongs in my kitchen washing my dishes and cock. Your test tube baby is a freak of nature. Write a poem about that. And so you can't really dare a poet to write a poem because... And so I write a poem. And this one is for all of you who, like, navigate all of this bullying online and all of this crazy shit that people would say to you that they could never say in front of your face because you just, like, fuck them up real quick, right? So um, this is really a rant for all the people who don't like rants. This is the moment to go. <laughs> for the rest of you, hopefully there is room in there that you can identify with. If you are not a feminist, this is also the moment to vacate the premises. But I mean, thank you. Thank you for the writers that came before me and like, just, you know, it, it, you know how much drama you get from your family for writing this shit. None? You all have perfect families. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Tweet this motherfucker. Obviously, you are a rotting dick. An asswipe. An open sore existing among the worst tumors that plague humanity. You are an apology someone should have made to women centuries ago. And today, you remain the very reason abortions must be, must be legal and available to every woman who finds herself carrying the figurative fetus of your fetid misogyny. Get the fuck out of my womb, you hater of your own origin. You forget you came from some woman's cunt. The pussy you so deride provided the path for you to get here, spewing your sick soliloquy. Your existence also makes a good argument for capital punishment only. I hold myself accountable to a more compassionate code of ethics. So I will refrain from advocating for the archaic quartering of you. I will also resist the urge to imagine you shackled in sequestered servitude, kneeling at the altar of some woman's holy punani, washing her feet with your mouth. Only I would not wish her the degradation of your tongue on her flesh, your feet on her floors. I will spend my entire life trying to protect my daughter from the slime of your ignorance, the sweat of your hate. Coward that you are, you hiding behind the intangible shroud of the virtual. Your keystrokes are the only ones with any fucking power, you impotent, unimportant little man. You splatter the male identity with the putridity you exude. Rotting apple, ganarial wound refusing to heal. You would have us conclude that most men are like you, but for the stellar examples of men in my life, I would think you the norm. Your actions might inform the love I cradle for those small boys in my circle, earnestly learning how to be better than the monster you have consistently chosen to be. Far and away, fucking Frankenstein, you frighten me with your ability to keep breathing, your inclination to replicate, to recruit, to keep pressing the boot of your discrimination upon the necks of generation after generation after generation. The only thing that prevents me from raising arms and going gorilla after you with a fucking gun is this collective dedication to the eradication of your kind. All across these borders of feminism and race, spaces held wire against the throat of inequality. Women from every walk of life continue to resist you, heart and body. With cunts and collarbones, we kill your fucking cowardice in kitchens and bedroom. We rebuke all you offer as fact. The act of tweeting something does not make it true, you ignorant motherfucker. You are only a narrow opinion constructed poorly. In 140 characters, your cavalry is not nearly as committed as mine. From Nairobi to New York City, from Kingston, Jamaica to motherfucking Jakarta, these litanies we are forced to compose will stand as evidence to your crumbling motherfucking tyranny. Time will hold your actions as crimes against humanity. And as it was with every disease that came before you, the strongest, most admirable parts of being woman, of being human, will keep adapting over and over. You go ahead and watch us adapt, motherfucker. Watch us morph, hatch, 
birth a power reminiscent of Harriet Tubman, Nanny of the Maroons, and Sojourner Truth. History has already shown us what doesn't kill us will only make us stronger. Are you listening, motherfucker? What? Old, this is pre. We are pre. And we are grateful to you so all for joining us. This is the photo op. Here it is right now. Thank you. Clap yourselves. Purchase the text. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>